You know, and if we're not here this morning because of that old, old story, then we're here for the wrong reason. And of course, this morning especially is we come together as a body of believers and observe the Lord's Supper together as our Lord and Savior instructed His disciples to do, His followers to do, and to do that in remembrance of His sacrifice and of His death on the cross that He freely and willingly gave of His own life for us, for you, and for me. And that's just simply the point of my message this morning before we partake together of the Lord's Supper. And I would like for us to do something, and I don't think I've ever done this as pastor, but instead of you turning with me to the passage this morning, I'm just going to ask simply that you just listen. And uh, I'm reading from the 19th chapter of John, and the reason why I'm asking you just to listen this morning is because I want us all this morning just to simply focus on the cross. And, you know, periodically, Laura will ask me, what are you preaching on today? What are you preaching on today? And, and she asked me last night, and I told her this morning, I was just preaching on the cross. And she said, well, that's a good thing. We need to be preaching on the cross. And we certainly do. So if you'll just listen as I read from the 19th chapter of John, and just think about the cross of Christ and the sacrifice that He gave for us, beginning in verse 31. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. And because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. And the soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. And the man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. And he knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. And these things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. You know, the Apostle John says here, he gives his whole reason towards the end of this chapter as to why he's putting this down. And how important these events and how significant this event is in Jesus' death on the cross. He says, I saw it with my own eyes. And we know from scripture that John was there. And he says, I am giving testimony to it. And this testimony is true. And, and I love that. You know, because we got people all over our world today who do not believe that the cross is true. They may believe that Jesus might have been crucified on the cross, but they don't believe that Jesus conquered death in the grave and rose again on the third day. They believe Jesus was just any other ordinary man, and he died, and he's still dead today. But John says, I was there, I saw it with my own eyes, I'm giving testimony, and this testimony is true, and I'm giving this testimony so that you may believe. And if you can't believe, based on God's word and John's testimony, then I don't know what it's going to take. Let me pray. Father God, thank you for John's word, your word this morning. Father, I pray in these next few moments, as we look at the cross, Father, this foundation for our faith, Jesus Christ, God made flesh, who hung and who died, and who paid our debt, Father. I pray to your Lord for this. He'll speak to our hearts. Father, we will hear your word this morning, and your word will change us. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Just real quickly, I want to look at five viewpoints of the cross this morning. And the first viewpoint I want us to think about 
is the viewpoint of God Almighty Himself. You know, the cross during Roman times and Roman rules, it was the point of execution for criminals. It was a place of judgment. It was a place of condemnation. And it was the most heinous, cruel, just inhumane way that anyone could be put to death. It was a very slow, painful death. Just completely inhumane. And, and that's what the Romans were known for. Their cruelty. Their barbaricness. And this was the way criminals were put to death. But the cross of Jesus Christ from the viewpoint of God is the place where God demonstrated for us His great, unimaginable, undeserved love and mercy for His creation and for all of humanity. In the second chapter of Ephesians, it says, because of His great love for us, God who is rich in mercy... And as I was thinking about that yesterday and, and, and thinking about what I was going to say this morning, thinking about those words, rich in mercy. God certainly had to be rich in mercy to forgive a sinner like me. But because of His great love for us and because of being rich in mercy, He made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. And it is by God's grace that we have been saved. And you're going to hear the world tell you over and over again how to be saved. And what you have to do to be saved. How you have to get things straight in your life first before God will accept you and be saved. But that is completely, absolutely wrong according to what we're told in God's Word here. It is simply by grace and grace alone. Because if it was by anything else, there is not one person in here this morning that would have earned or could earn salvation. Even if Christ had still died on the cross, you would not have been able to earn your salvation from sin and the penalty of sin, the wages of sin, which is death. See, the cross is the place where God Almighty, He reached down and He gave His only Son as the final, ultimate sacrifice so that we who are unholy, we who are unrighteous, might be made holy and might be made righteous. As it says in Hebrews chapter 9, just as man is destined to die once, after that to face the judgment. So Christ was sacrificed once, once, to take away the sins of many people. And then it says, He will come back. He will appear a second time, not to bear our sins again, not to die again, but He will come back to bring salvation to those who are waiting for Him. When our salvation as believers in Christ is made complete. So from the viewpoint of God Almighty, the cross is where His Son gave His life, paid the penalty for our sins, and God is completely satisfied with that sacrifice. The second viewpoint is the viewpoint of Jesus Christ. Just think, and this is why I didn't want you to follow along with me in Scripture. I want you to just think and just picture the cross in your mind and Christ hanging there. And praise the Lord, He's not hanging there anymore as you see people wearing the necklaces. He is in heaven at the right hand of the Father waiting for the Word, go and get my children. But the cross from the viewpoint of Christ is the place where Jesus completely, ultimately, totally, unconditionally surrendered to His Father's will. You remember His prayer in the garden right before His rest. It says, Father, if this cup can be taken from me, 
Father, please, but, but, not my will, but your will. Philippians 2 8 says, being found in the appearance as a man, Jesus Christ humbled himself and he became obedient to death. Now, when we think of obedience as human beings, we think of obedience, well, I'll be obedient to a point. But when that point is reached, or if I have to be obedient beyond that point, mm -mm, not going to go that far. But Jesus was obedient to the point, even to death, giving his life. And that's what it says here in Philippians. Even death on the cross. As I mentioned earlier, this wasn't a death where you're just given a lethal injection and in a matter of minutes you are just stop breathing, no pain. It wasn't a death, just an all of a sudden instantaneous death. It was an unimaginable, excruciating tormenting death where he literally drowned from his own fluids within his lungs building up. That's why they hung there for hours. That's why Pilate, as we read in our passage this morning, because the religious leaders, here's what they're concerned about. They're concerned about Sunday coming in. Well, Saturday in their case. The Sabbath. And this was going to be a special Sabbath. And so in order for us to be able to be, have our, and observe our special Sabbath, have our church, we need to make sure that these that are hanging on the cross are done away with quickly. They're hanging there way too long. It's been too many hours. Pilate, can we go ahead and break their legs and be done with it? Can you imagine having that attitude before coming to church on a Sunday morning? You're not concerned about worshiping God Almighty. You're concerned about what I need to get done on Saturday before I come to church on Sunday. This is what the religious leaders were worried about. And then it says also in Philippians 2.9, you see the cross was the place where Christ was exalted. Go on, it says God exalted Him to the highest place and gave Him the name that is above every name. And then the cross is also, from the viewpoint of Christ, the place where Christ, through His obedience, through His surrender, that God Almighty is glorified. Because it goes on and says in Philippians 2, 10 and 11, that at that name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And one day, folks, there is going to come a day when unbelievers are going to stand before God and they are going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Regardless of whatever decision they made here on this earth during this life. They will confess Jesus Christ is Lord. And that's what it says here. Every knee will bow in heaven and on earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. You see, it's not just admitting or just making a statement. I mean, it certainly is that. But ultimately, it's about glorifying God. And the cross was the place because of His obedience, His complete surrender to His Heavenly Father, where Christ glorified God Almighty. The third viewpoint. We've seen the viewpoint of God Almighty, the viewpoint of Jesus Christ. Now the viewpoint of you and me as believers. You see, the viewpoint of the cross is it's the place where Jesus took our punishment. Let me tell you a little story I was probably maybe seven or eight at the time. And uh, probably some of you experienced this as little children where you go get your father's tools and, and you, you play. And it wasn't so much the playing with the tools that was the problem. The problem, at least with my dad, was they never got put back. And so when dad needed his tools and he couldn't find them, Carl and my sister Cheryl probably left them out somewhere 
under a bed or out in the yard where they get all nice and rusty and useless and, and that kind of thing. And I was about seven or eight, and we had been told plenty of times, don't touch daddy's tools because we wouldn't put them back. Well, Carl decides, I need a hammer. I don't even know what I needed. Yeah, I'm seven or eight years old. I'm beat on something. And Carl decides, I'm going to go get Daddy's hammer. And I'm outside in front of our house, and I'm doing whatever it is I need the hammer for. I'm doing whatever it is for it. My sister happens to be outside as well, and she's doing something else, you know. But we're kind of right there together, and we're just playing, having a nice, good little dandy old time. Guess who walks out? And my dad sees me using his hammer. My sister happens to be right there. Y'all don't think so bad in your pastor after this, okay? <laughs> and they look, he looks at me and my sister and he says, which one of you got the hammer? <laughs> you know what your pastor did? <laughs> she did. Y'all know me too well, don't you? <laughs> she did. Of course, my sister, being the honest, truthful one, says... I did not. Carl did it. And we go back and forth, and, and my mom's involved with it this time. She says, look, one of you better fess up, because one of you are lying. You know what your pastor did? She did. <laughs> but we got our punishment. I don't believe we actually got a spanking. We got our share of spankings. I don't believe at that time we got a spank. And, and it was early, late one afternoon, early evening. But what we did get is our supper immediately and our baths and got put in bed. My sister included. You know, she still reminds me of that to this day. <laughs> I will never forget her. But here, here's the point of that story. My sister endured the punishment that she absolutely did not deserve. Because I was the guilty one. See, that's what Jesus Christ did for you and me. He endured the punishment that He did not deserve, even though we are and were the guilty ones. See, that's the viewpoint from you and me. In 1 Peter 2, it says, He Himself, Christ, bore our sins. And He bore them in His physical body on that cross, on that tree, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness by His wounds. We are healed. You see, the cross, from the viewpoint of view of me, is also the place where we have a choice to make. And if you remember... You know the story. On either side of Jesus hanging there at Calvary, two thieves, two criminals who deserved the punishment they were given. And one of them is hanging there on the cross and he's just hurling insults at Jesus because they know, I mean, there's the you know, piece of wood above Jesus' cross that said, you know, King of the Jews in a mocking way. And so they knew who Jesus was claiming to be. And so one of the criminals that are hanging there, and he's just hurling all kinds of insults at Jesus, and he's saying, aren't you the Christ? Well, if you're the Christ, then save yourself, which Jesus certainly could have done. But that would have been against his father's will. And he wasn't going to do that. But listen to what he said, the criminal. He says, save yourself and us. You know what that criminal was more worried about? He was more worried about himself. You're the Christ. You can certainly save yourself, but you know what? You can also save us. Now's the time to do it. But then it also says in Luke chapter 23, the other criminal hanging on the other side. He rebuked the first one. And I know we're told as children not to say this word, but I can just imagine that other criminal hanging there and telling the other criminal and saying, shut up. 
But he says, don't you fear God. He says, you are under the same sentence. Now what's he talking about, the same sentence? Is he talking about the same sentence as himself? Is he talking about the same sentence as Christ? No, Christ was the innocent one. What he's talking about is, you deserve death. Just like I deserve death. But this one that is hanging in between us, he doesn't deserve death. So don't you fear God? He says, we're punished justly. We're getting what we deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then Jesus says this to that criminal. He says, I tell you the truth. That today you will be with me in paradise. See, both of those criminals had a chance to make. As far as you and I are concerned, the cross is the place where we have a choice to make. And that choice is pardon, or that choice is judgment. The fourth thing, the viewpoint is Satan. See, but from the cross, the cross is the place of triumph for Satan. The Son of God has been put to death. But, it was only victory for three days. Ultimately, from the viewpoint of Satan, the cross is the place of his complete, final defeat and destruction. In Hebrews 2, it says, He, Jesus, shared in their humanity, talking about us, so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death. That is the devil, Satan. And the cross, from the viewpoint of Satan, is the place of his final, ultimately, ultimate defeat and destruction. The last viewpoint, the viewpoint of the world. The cross, from the viewpoint of the world, is nothing more than a symbol. It's nothing more than a good luck charm. How many cross tattoos do you see on athletes or celebrities? How many cross necklaces do you see on celebrities or athletes or just ordinary people that you see around the community? It's nothing more than a good luck charm. It's nothing more than just a symbol. You see, the world sees Jesus as just another historical character. He's just another man. And because of their being blinded by sin in their life, they cannot see Jesus as anything else. It even says so in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? But has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know Him, then God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. You see, from the viewpoint of the world, the cross is foolishness. It's nothing more than a symbol. So the cross is the place where Jesus Christ, that perfect, spotless Lamb of God, was led to be crucified. The cross is the place where Jesus was nailed, He was stabbed, literally suffocated and drowned as his lungs slowly filled with fluid. The cross is the place where Jesus died, but he also conquered death. And he conquered death for you and for me. So what is your viewpoint of the cross? Many of y'all remember, and I, I wrap up with this. Several years ago, a movie came out directed by Mel Gibson, Gibson called The Passion of Christ. I don't know how many of you saw it. Um, I actually saw it. Very realistic depiction, and for the most part, pretty scripturally accurate portrayal of the cross and Jesus' suffering and, and death. And, and of course, that movie was rated R. But one person wrote, and I really don't know who wrote this, but they had a different take on what that R rating really meant of that movie. Let me read it to you. In this movie, the R rating also stands for relevant, 
and realistic for it really happened because we were rebellious and we needed a redeemer and we needed to be reconciled and we needed to be recovered and we needed to be regenerated. Jesus needed to be rejected so that we could have a relationship and not just a religion. The R rating is to remind us to remember what Jesus did to remove our sin and to render Satan powerless and to rescue us from eternity in hell. The R rating is to show that Jesus was responsible for giving you rest. And as a result of his death, Jesus retired your debt. The R rating means that some will be repulsed. Some will refuse to believe. Some will be reluctant. Some will think that you are ridiculous in believing that death was required. The R rating means that the result of sin has been reversed. And now through faith in Christ, your reward is eternity. And you are now righteous before God because you have received Him as the ruler of your soul. What a revolutionary and radical solution to redeem mankind. Yes, the cross is our rating.